Good afternoon, um, everybody. Can we please take our seats uh, so that we can start? We have a very Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Yes, I called her. She spoke to her. Yes. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, please, let's take our seats um, so that we can get started. Um, this is a, a very exciting topic indeed. Uh, Education, the power behind empowering women. Um, this event uh, is uh, organized uh, by the Permanent Mission of Israel to the United Nations um, in partnership uh, with the UN Habitat, uh, UN Women, and uh, the Belt Isi uh, Shapiro, um, which is uh, an organization uh, that aims to change lives of people with disabilities. And of course, the MASHAV, Israel's Agency uh, for Development Cooperation, International Development Cooperation. Um, I'm very happy to see that the room is, is full because this is indeed a topic that is very close to our hearts and has potential to actually transform uh, the lives of women if we do it right. But before I go into uh, so much uh, detail, uh, let me ask the ambassador, uh, the deputy ambassador of the um, Israel Permanent Mission uh, to the United Nations to welcome us uh, to this event. Uh, ambassador Roth has served as Israel's deputy permanent representative to the United Nations since 2013. And prior to this, he was head of the Bureau for Personnel Training in the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, which is responsible for the training programs of Israeli diplomats worldwide. So we are in good hands, and he will uh, you know, help us to behave diplomatically if uh, we <laughs> fail in some cases, especially when we have to ask people to stop talking. Um, the ambassador um, you know, has also... Um, you know, uh, has a bachelor and master's degree in economics and business administration, both of them from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, Ambassador, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. It's uh, so good to be here and to be a people, and uh, we are very, very happy with the uh, uh, to do this. Women, which we would like uh, to promote as well, and uh, we have here with us the uh, Secretary General, very high position in this institution, but also in the Israeli uh, Parliament, and and uh, representative of uh, the Israeli uh, society and uh, uh, 
who are coming here to, to share our, our experience. Uh, years ago, I, um, I, I heard this riddle, which kind of accompanied me, and it speaks about a father and a son who, will go, who are in a, uh, in a car accident, and unfortunately the father passes away, the, uh, is killed, the son is, uh, is uh, bed, uh, badly hurt, and he is taken to the hospital for an emergency operation, they call the top surgeon there. The top surgeon comes in, looks at the, at, at, at the boy and says, I can't operate on him, it's my son. Oh. How can that be? The father passed away. And I try that with people who work for me, with women as well, and I guess that even if... It's a very important conference. Some of us, do not, it took him a second to realize that the doctor was the mother. And. And, and, and this kind of keeps me understanding the, uh, the, how we are. And even, I think, in Israel, I'm not sure it's even, I think we did probably reach 50-50 on, on, with doctors in, in Israel, maybe. I'm not sure, or close to it. But still, we are centered of thinking of a doctor as, 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 as a, a, a man. It is important for my country. It is important for Israel women equality. We believe that we can have only a healthy and a society if we have equal rights for women and equal opportunities for women. It is, uh, we are not in the business of telling you things uh, as, as, as they're not. We did have, I think we were third to have a uh, um, women prime minister. We were, uh, we had women heading all of our branches of government at some point or another. Three major banks, Israeli banks, are headed by, by women. But this doesn't necessarily say things are perfect. There is still much to do and much to, and much to do more, but it is something which we would like uh, to share uh, uh, in the world. I don't want to speak too much, but I do want to tell you something about my personal uh, experience. I say that in, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I had the experience, unfortunately, in my life uh, to feel a little more than maybe other men about about what it is to be a woman. I always felt that I, I was a partner, a good partner in in raising the children. I tried always never to say I'm uh, I'm helping out with the kids or helping out with, uh, but but to be a partner. But of course, the uh, as as life brought me to a situation where I had to deal with uh, with with raising children by myself. I, I, for the first time, understood a little what it is to be a woman, a little what it is to stand up in the middle, meeting, middle in, of a meeting and say, well, I have to go now because I pick up the children and it doesn't matter who's sitting there. Or, 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 or to start knowing the names of the mothers. Imagine, you, you can't, you, you probably never tried that to do, but as a man, to call up for a play date and the father answers the phone, and it's like he, the, the I could count. It's like an Olympic record. The, by the time he moves it on, he's so scared actually to deal with that, and all of those issues. How do you continue? How do you go on? How how are you, like my sister-in-law, who's heading one one of the biggest um, you know organization in Israel, and how do you still have to take care of so many things that most of us men do not? So I, I take off my hat and I. I'll do what Nelly has asked me to, uh, not to speak too much. I'd want to thank again uh, all of you for coming. I want to just take the opportunity to thank uh, Nelly Shilo, our, our uh, <laughs> counselor for, 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 for human rights, and, and, uh, and, and uh, as well as Nadav Yasod, who is uh, working with her. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, you know, what you have experienced is being a real man of the 21st century. Yeah. So we applaud you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure also to introduce uh, Her Excellency, uh, Ms. Yardena Mela Horowitz, uh, who has been involved in the running of the Knesset. This is the parliament for 20 years, you know. Bef she's a, 30 years, uh, she's a powerful woman. You know, before moving to her current position as Secretary General of the Knesset in 2010, 
she held the office of Deputy Secretary General for seven years. Having completed her bachelor's studies in, in general and Jewish history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, she then attained an MBA from the University of Derby's Jerusalem branch. Amongst her previous professional position, uh, Ms. Mela Horowitz has been the chief of staff of the Knesset Speaker's Office and the director of the Knesset State Control Committee. Uh, you're very welcome to also welcome us to this event. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Yardena Meller Horowitz, and I am the current Secretary General of the Israeli Parliament, the Knesset, the seventh but the first woman. I have actively accompanied the administrative and parliamentary legislative process for many years. Among the very many laws dealing with equality of rights and gender politics, I would like to focus on the topic which was brought up so well in this movie that of young girls who are forced into marriages or get married at a young age. Two years ago, we amended the laws for the legal marriage age from 17 to 18. As a very diverse multicultural society, ranging from the ultra-secular to the ultra-orthodox communities, in both the Arab and Jewish population, this initiative recognized the need for women to finish at least secondary education and provide them the means and the ability to be economically um, and professionally independent and, if desired, continue to an academic education. This amendment was brought about following extensive research which indicate indicated that women who married young were subjected to sexual, physical, or emotional violence and are often married off against their will. This law enables young women to finish their education, make an informed decision whether they wish to be married, and allows them to choose if this is the path they wish to go, to take. I have been lucky to witness so much achieved in this legislative field, but there are still many challenges that we have to overcome. The Knesset plays a key role in the process, both as the legislator responsible for enacting key legislating and incorporating the rules and principles which allow it to become a gender-sensitive parliament and a role model for Israeli society. Next week, on March 70th, we will ex exercise our democratic right to vote in a general election and the 20th Knesset will be elected. Parliamentarians will continue their commitment to promote gender equality and the advancement to the status of women in Israel and I am privileged to be a part of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, and uh, we congratulate you for the good laws that you are making. And uh, we are always pushing for the implementation of the good laws. But as we prepare for the elections, we also look forward to a result of 50-50 <laughs> in Israel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. At least. <laughs> Now, please allow me to introduce to you a distinguished panel. Uh, we are going to have some exciting um, news information from uh, a very, very uh, powerful uh, panel. Our first panelist uh, is Ms. Hannah Azule Hasfari, uh, who for the past 30 years, she has worked as a leading actress, you know, in plays, TV, film, and was twice a recipient of the Best Leading Actress Awards from the Israel Film Academy. Congratulations. <laughs> she is a, a woman leading in her field as an actress, but her commitment to social justice is also uh, really commendable. She has produced uh, a film called Orange People, 
a story about the clash of traditional and modern values held by an aging matriarch and her daughters. But in addition to that, um, she has explored the empowerment of women in her two documentary series, one called The Workers, exploring the lives of female factory workers, and the other called My Little Empire, focusing on women's uh, empowerment in entrepreneurship. Very welcome, very welcome, Hannah. Our second panelist is uh, Ms. Hava Curry. She's the current acting director of the Gouda um, Maya Mount Carmel International Training Center in Haifa. How many of you have benefited from this center? Yes, so yes, we have all benefited. <laughs> Not all, but a lot of people, a lot of women from all over the world have really uh, been empowered through this center. Uh, Ms. Carey has worked extensively within the areas of women's leadership and empowerment, having developed international training programs and workshops on key issues ranging from human trafficking and violence against women to NGO management and leadership. And prior to that, she was uh, the director of an urban development rehabilitation program in the Prime Minister's office in Israel. Very welcome, Havel. Can you give her a hand? And then our next panelist would be Dr. Aisa Kirabo Kasira, uh, the Deputy Executive Director and Assistant Secretary General for UN Habitat, the United Nations Agency for Human Settlements and Sustainable Urban Development. And prior to joining UN Habitat, uh, Dr. Kasira has for many years uh, worked with the government of Rwanda at various levels. She's the mayor who transformed Kigali. You know, so I really um, applaud her for that. Uh, but she has also been a governor of the Eastern Province and an elected member of parliament, a true leader indeed. Our final uh, panelist is uh, Madame Jean Judes, beautiful name and beautiful woman. <laughs> and Ms. Judes is the executive director of Bade Isi Shapiro, Israel's leading nonprofit organization in the field of disabilities, which impacts over 30,000 people annually within Israel and also in the international community. She has over 20 years of experience in this field and is very passionate about improving the quality of life of people living with disabilities. Very welcome. So we are in very good hands, and I'm sure that uh, over this uh, time, as we are reviewing the Beijing Plus 20, we are reviewing where we are uh, with the MDGs. You know, we have seen the benefits of educating the girl child and the woman in terms of economic gains due to improved employability. We have seen gains in health and social, uh, and social welfare. As educated women save lives, they invest in educating their children and so on. But panelists, we, we want to challenge you today, you know. If we are to see education as a key driver for empowering women, how would we shape education, you know, to lead to the true empowerment beyond just uh, equipping women to survive, you know? Just to give you three examples, what, the, what nature, level, and investment in education is needed that would lead to women's economic empowerment uh, that includes asset building, wealth creation, and business leadership, not just surviving at the micro level. What kind of education is needed to lead to women, not just being political leaders, being elected to power, but being able to transform society? What kind of education do we need that will um, empower women to negotiate mutually beneficial relationships, resist violence, and also protect their children. There are so many uh, types of empowerment that we could talk about, but we look forward to hearing you know, from you, your views from your experience on how education can really empower women truly. And we will start uh, with our first panelist, Ms. Hannah Azulay Hasfari. Over to you. And I would ask the panelists, we have five minutes each, and uh, um, I'm sitting next to Ambassador. He will help me to diplomatically um, <laughs> <laughs> ask you to finish. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Ms. Hannah, over to you. Uh, good day. Well, as you've already heard, my name is Hannah Zulayasfari, and I'm a first generation 
of an educated woman in my family. I'm excited to be standing here before you. It is a great honor and privilege and also a great responsibility to be given the opportunity to raise uh, the critical and important issue of female child marriage and to put it on the international agenda. For that, I would like to thank the State of Israel, the Israeli delegation, and Mr. Poso, our ambassador to the United Nations. Thank you, and to Mr. Roth. I didn't know he's going to be here, so. This year, Orange People, a movie that I wrote and directed, came out. The movie deals with mother's daughter's relationships in the migrant society of modern days Israel. As you can guess, this is not an easy topic. Specifically, what, if what shapes these relationships is the intergenerational transference of the trauma of marriage, pregnancy, and giving birth of a 12 years old girl somewhere in the Moroccan Atlas Mountains. I've edited a 10 minute piece of my movie for this committee in order to illustrate, even if, in, if, in, if only partly, this horrible situation and its consequences. After the screening, I would like to say a few words. Thank you. Zuara, Mama, respect G. شوش الا يجي العروس ديالك ويشوف ما تعرفش تكب اش يكون العروس ديالي מה? רגע, אז חוץ מאמא ודודה פאני יש לך עוד ילד? אז איפה הוא נעלם? מה זה ילד או ילדה? בניטה.
فينك يا حبيبتي خبيتي عليا اجي لعندي زورا زورا اوه فين تينا سبتك ما رتيتي راك لسخك بنات نيدا بيت إما شلي ما تمرت وانخ نستي لي رايون تحالي سباتل ووصل يا خركاخ بابا جاني في المنا وكل لي باش تعطيني الحليب والعشل ومنين دابا نجيب لك الحليب والعشل لا انا حبت الحليب والعشاء ماما انا حبت الحليب والعشاء انا حبت الحليب والعشاء انا حبت الحليب والعشاء انا حبت الحليب والعشاء بارك عليا عبيها هاد البنيته والبنيته هاد البنيته وخرجوا عليا انا خصني امراه ماشي دريه صغيره تمشي عند بابا صالي وتلقى صافي شكات سلام ماما
Ah, now you hear me? Okay. I would like first to share with you some uh, autobiographical details about my family and myself. My mother was born in a small village in the Atlas Mountains. She got married, divorced, moved to the big city of Casablanca where she met my father and started our family with him. Together, they immigrated to Israel where I was born. Being Zionist Jews, my parents were happy to live in Israel, but adjustment was hard. My father was an educated man, but his culture was Arabic. And my mother was highly intelligent, but she never got the right for education, and therefore, she was illiterate. The cultural gap between the European culture of modern day Israel and their own culture was immense. Raised and educated in the new culture, I erased my Jewish Arabic identity, and I never showed an interest in their past. It came with a terrible personal price, which then became the focal theme in all my work as an arti artist and as a social activist. I took it on myself to make present and equal the voice of the generation of my parents. Another movie I made called Shur, which told the story of how my family dealt with their migration to Israel, so success, and I was invited to many, many film festivals around the world. Among them, uh, the, the, the movie festival of the charming city of Tangier in Morocco. Nothing could prepare me of, to what I felt on my arrival. I've never been to Morocco until then, but I felt like I was born there. I got connected to the people, the views, the gestures, the language. I felt that my body and soul could remember the past experiences of my mother, grandmother, and ancestors. For the first time in my life, I could understand what the great psychologist Carl Jung defined as collective memory. Upon my arrival to Israel, I decided to write about the impact that this collective memory had on my personality. In order to do so, I had to, to ask my mother about her childhood in the Atlas Mountains. I was amazed by her story. It's not that I didn't hear it before, but I never really listened. All I remembered was that from time to time, she sat alone in the kitchen, crying, saying to herself, Fan bnita diali, fan bnita diali. Where is my little daughter? Where is my little child? The story that you have just witnessed in the movie is my mother's story, only much, 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 much more subtle. In reality, she married her first husband when she was about 12 years old, and she gave him three children. He divorced her one day, took her children from her, and sent her away from his home. Later, she found out that all three have died due to neglect. She was 80 years of age when she told me this story, but she cried as if it happened the day before. And when I asked her why did she agree to be wed at the age of 12, she looked at me with an amazement and said, Masouda, my sister, your auntie, was wed at the age of nine. She treated herself the same way that others have treated her, like an object transferred from one owner to another. The result, as you could see here now, was tragic. This moment between us made me realize my mother's amazingly passive state of mind, a state of mind which was passed to me through our collective memory. There's, of course, no comparison between her state of mind and, and my state of mind. It reminded me, but some of it, uh, I think some of it stayed with me in a way. It reminded me of the moments of my life when I chose to be passive and let others decide my, my destiny, just like my mother in the past. But I had no reason for that. I had all the conditions to say, to stand up and say, this is how, how I want it and this is how I don't want it, thanks to education. This moment took place so many years ago, but here I am now, today, standing before you, because I want to make a change. 
The scene in the movie that you've just saw where the girl abandons her baby and moves to the big city did not take place in reality. It was written by me for two reasons. The first, in order to tell the world what happens to a child that gives birth a child and loses her childhood and how this, is, this trauma affects the next generation. And the second, in order to amend the collective memory that I share with my mother and to give her and to myself the power to stand up and do something to change her destiny in retrospect. This is the healing power of art. But not everyone has the chance to change their consciousness the same way I did. There are millions of women all around the world that carry with them the collective memory of being treated like an object that was passed on them from their great-grandparent. But don't get me wrong. It did not happen only in Morocco. The same is true for women from Europe and America, much like for women as in Asia and Africa, from all states, all cultures. From some, it goes generation back, like me, and for others, 10 generations back. We all carry with us the collective memory of our ancient mothers of being an object. But the most terrible thing is that even today, millions of girls are all around the world at the age of eight, nine, and 13 years old, sold as an object to men who can do with them anything that comes to their minds. These girls are getting pregnant, and their body cannot hold the weight of the ba baby. Their body is deformed, their pelvis is broken, and they become crippled and terrified for the rest of their lives. Then they think into heavy depression or just simply die. And the world is being filled with talented but passive and sad women. I stand here before you today and ask you, or better say, demand that you take an action. You have the power to redefine the horrible act that is now being whitewashed as child marriage. The act of marriage is an act of mutual consent between two adults. But when a 10 years old minor who doesn't even know what it means to have sexual intercourse is being sold as an, in exchange for a cow or a jeep, this is not marriage. When a 12 years old girl who does not understand why she has to lay under an old man who hurts her instead of playing catch with her friends, this is not marriage. I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, millions of girls. Did it, when all of this is taking actions, this place in taking place, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm too excited for this horrible situation. When all this is taking place, this is not child marriage. This is child rape. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with me? Yes. Millions of girls all around the world are being raped every day and the world keeps silent. Dr. Vicky Shiran, uh, a woman of a color, an outstanding Israeli feminist, has taught me that a feminist woman is a woman that rubble against her destiny, that understand that her low social status is not a result of her horrible personality or her tough luck, but rather from her low social positioning of her poor political power but she will be able to rebel against her destiny and be freed from oppression, mainly if she could, she, she could see that she is not alone. This, is, this committee has to show women that they don't have to rebel on their own any longer. Therefore, the committee has to push every state to legislate two laws. The first, that every girl around the world must receive general education, just general education, but then to be educated to independence and assertiveness so that they could be, so that they could rebel against their oppressive destiny. And the second, to forbid female child marriage and to define it as rape. This committee has to do all that in its power to make sure that every state upholds these trivial and just laws. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hannah. This is a reality that we are in uh, even today. 
um, and we've had many experiences where even parliaments themselves have changed the law of mar marriage from just 15 to 16. I won't mention the country now, but we had to battle with that until the cultural leaders themselves actually you know, pushed it to 21 after they understood the gravity of this situation. So educate a girl and we have Hannah, you know, and you know, it, it's, it's amazing how much uh, real education can do. Now, we have very little time left and I would like to ask the next uh, panelist to give us just three minutes, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and what, what we really are looking for is, yes, there's the literacy that's important, uh, but what kind of education really empowers a woman to, to, to go beyond just surviving, to really making a difference in her life and in the lives of others? Thank you. Um, I want to remind our moderator, Christine, that she used to be my friend, and I hope, uh, no, we are still friends. <laughs> we are not friends today. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I have four minutes and a little clip, so uh, I'm asking for your f forgiveness. Um, I'd like to really thank Christine, Christine Masusi, who is our friend and colleague for many years. Uh, she's the regional director of Eastern African region of UN Women. She's doing fantastic work, and I'd like to thank you for agreeing to be the moderator today. <laughs> Now the four minutes. Um, I'd like to show a, a really short clip that we made just two weeks ago of participants staying at our center uh, on a course on violence against, uh, combating violence against women. Uh, it's a very short clip and then I'd like to say a few words. So uh, please, so you get to know our center and the participants who are the real actors. <laughs> Up until today, Mashav has hosted more than a quarter of a million trainees from all over the world here in Israel, from more than 130 countries in a very, very vast variety of training programs in the fields of agriculture, water, uh, gender, of course, education, health issues, uh, and many more. My name is Arit Insamo from Ghana. I work for Judicial Service of Ghana as a magistrate. Ghanaians are very wonderful people. Ghana is a very wonderful country. However, behind the cheerful faces of Ghanaians, there is a secret. There is a high prevalence of domestic violence against women and children in Ghana, and we report on average almost 10 or 15 cases in courts per day relating to violence against women and children. My name is Christopher Lati. Um, I come from Ghana. I work with the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. Ghana is pa uh, particularly a patriarchal society where male dominance is, I mean, uh, seen as a strength in every man or every boy. Female socialization also goes in a way to make women submissive to men. So this workshop has actually offered me a very good, I mean, opportunity to learn and also to regain strength. You know, it's sometimes you sit in your office, you are doing so much and it's, it's as if nothing has been done. But I have realized that uh, I've been given more or less a dose of energy. Mabuhay, I'm Marisa Resulta. I'm a pediatrician by profession and I'm also part of the Child Protection Unit of the Philippine General Hospital, which is a non-government organization in my country dedicated to prevent children from abuse and neglect. Uh, one thing that I've learned from, this, uh, uh, from combating violence against women and children is empowerment of women and children. When I go back to my home country, I plan to create an awareness program to be able to educate the women uh, starting from their house, from their community, 
and at the same time educating their children to be able to be aware of what's happening to them on how they can be able to contribute to the society. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Hello, I am Angelina Atabong from Cameroon. I'm a magistrate. I work in the Department of Human Rights and International Cooperation in the Ministry of Justice, Cameroon. I came to Israel in quest of solutions on violence against women in my country. This workshop has offered me the opportunity to gather skills that will be very useful to impact positively on the lives of men, children, and women when I go back to my country. Most often, women who are victims of domestic violence are unable to leave the abusive environment because they are financially dependent on their male partners. In Cameroon, certain obnoxious cultural practices contribute to women's lack of inheritance rights, lack of access to land, leadership, and make women more vulnerable to sexual exploitation and trafficking. At the workshop, it was made overwhelmingly clear that capacity building is one of the surest ways of fighting violence against women. I would like to say, yes, we have challenges in Cameroon in combating violence against women, but these challenges are surmountable. Namaste. I am Anand Kumar uh, from India. I work for uh, refugees uh, in New Delhi. Personally, I am a victim of uh, domestic violence. I personally feel I pushed out from my own home because of the you know, various violences. Every uh, woman, be it a girl, small child of age of two years, or a, a young woman, or married woman, or even old woman who is 70 years old, being raped, assaulted, killed, kidnapped, so the situation is uh, really uh, no, more than alarming. Uh, India is known for its uh, no, the uh, diverse culture and tradition. But uh, uh, for this group of people, uh, women and children, it is, uh, no, I can say, it, it, it's a curse. Uh, because, because of this culture and traditions, they are suffering more and more. Thank uh, Machav and uh, Golda Meir Center for giving me this opportunity to, to be here 25 days and then I really learned so much and then I, I definitely I can contribute more to bring a definite change uh, uh, in combating violence against women and children. Thank you. Namaste. Many people admire Golda Meir for taking on various positions in the Israeli government throughout her lifetime, the last becoming Prime Minister of Israel. But a lesser known fact is that at the age of 14, she ran away from home because her mother insisted she must marry. Her mother used the phrase, men don't like smart women. Golda Meir was ambitious, and she purchased a ticket to Denver, where her sister lived, and left her parents distraught. After coming to Israel and becoming active in politics, in 1956, she was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs. Her first trip was to Africa, and upon returning, she said, we need to do tikkun olam, healing the world, to provide development and humanitarian aid to the developing countries, to alleviate the suffering of those at great risk. This was the beginning of Israel's aid program, whose acronym is MASHAV, the Development Cooperation Program, which she instituted as a division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She felt that Israel's practical experience in nation building and agriculture, community development, and women's leadership could be a model for Africa. She is quoted as saying the greatest challenge to leaders and educators is to bring idealism into the picture, despite the cloud that hangs over humanity. In 1961, the Golda Meir Mount Carmel International Training Center, MCTC, under the auspices of Mashav, opened its doors to women leaders and those aspiring to become leaders. In order to promote women's empowerment, to participate in decision-making in their communities and their countries. MCT was the first international center in the world to train women. 
We address the connection between women's empowerment and development. For more than 50 years, hundreds of training activities have been carrying, carried out for the benefit of women and now men as well from Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, Oceania, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East, our Palestinian neighbors, Jordan, and Turkey. We train in the fields of entrepreneurship and innovation, running a sustainable business, early childhood education, training educators, and helping to introduce new programs in kindergartens to better develop children's creativity and imagination all over the world. Community development, combating violence against women and children, safer cities for women that you'll hear about from our colleague, um, combating human trafficking through sensitizing the cr criminal justice system, and training women to take on leadership positions in all realms of life through confidence building, assertiveness, and believing in their own abilities. Why do the training in Israel, we're often asked. First of all, all our programs are carried out in cooperation with our UN partners to broaden the impact of the training and to draw upon the foremost experts in the field. Israel is a continuous laboratory of development with many challenges, few natural resources, therefore developing our human resource. We are gender sensitive and, cult and culture sensitive. Golda Meir was by no means a feminist, but she knew that we cannot afford not to develop 51% of our human resource, women. Prime Minister Ben-Gurion was known to say to Golda, you are the only man in the cabinet. <laughs> but her answer is less known. She said to him, Mr. Prime Minister, if I were to say to you that you are the only whim woman in the cabinet, would you take it as a compliment? <laughs> as an immigrant myself coming to Israel around 40 years ago, as a tiny baby, I am grateful <laughs> to have been given the chance to be a part of this amazing development work, to see many women come at the beginning of a course shy and self-conscious, and leave with their heads up high and self-confident to change their communities and nations. I would like to also make an announcement that in uh, October uh, 2015, we'll be holding, we just received uh, word that we received the budget to behold the next International Conference for Women Leaders, something we do every two years. And it will be on closing gender economic gaps, something very important that has been spoken about a lot in this CSW. We would love to see you all in Israel, in Haifa, the beautiful city of Haifa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hava. And I think what I have witnessed myself is people coming out of there with real business plans that they actually implement. Uh, to change both their lives and the lives of others. So it's an amazing, amazing institution. Um, Aysa, uh, can you please tell us uh, what do you think in education or what kind of education uh, can truly empower the woman? Thank you very much, Christine. Let me thank you and you and women for having gathered us all here together not, not you and women. to reflect <laughs> on. Uh, yeah, but we're here. Uh, I'm here on the invitation of you and women, and I happen to also be here. But I think it's really good that as women from different walks of life come to reflect on where we are coming from and where we want to go. And let me thank uh, the colleague panelists for their very deep and uh, genuine sharing, which will make it easier maybe for me. We all, I think, carry heavy memories. Memories of joy and sometimes pain. And I think for the question that you have raised, Kristen, it is very profound. And I can try to respond to it from four perspectives. I think the first perspective is right from the word go. The girl child has a lot much more in terms of challenges when, we, when they go to school than the boy child. So is the education system capable of addressing all the different aspects of the needs of the girl child? And secondly, there are many women 
who are in need of education, who are yearning for knowledge, because they're required to, to, to deliver so much with very little. And that's why I believe it's important that as leaders, we try to avail a holistic and integrated package that begins first and foremost with, I think, a self, what I can call a self-identification process that can help the girl, child, and the woman, first of all, to regain one's self-esteem and one's purpose in life, and then get to number two, acquiring the skills to do whatever you want to do. I think that was very well elaborated by Hannah. And a number of us go on with that, and there's hardly any space to express it, because the higher you go, the more powerful you expect it to be, <laughs> and therefore you shouldn't be seen to be in any way lacking, and yet we have so many demands that we cannot fulfill. So the first point is let's begin, or let's have a, a system that helps people to identify themselves, to know their self-worth, to know who they are in society, and to be firm enough to demand from society that which is their right. I think that is one, and it's important for us now as the UN family to work in an integrated manner. I'm maybe uh, lucky that when I was, the first time I worked with the UN, when I was mayor of Kigali, my first interaction with the UN, Josephine is there, was with UN women. And UN women introduced me to the delivering as one system because I had so much on my hands, and I wasn't that very, you know, um, well versed with all the skills of what I needed, but I had limited time. I couldn't afford giving one hour to UNDP, one to UN Women, one to UNFPA, one. But when they presented themselves as a team, and I had my challenges of women in poverty in the city, whom I couldn't initially identify as vulnerable, because you know the statistics of Rwanda. But in reality, when it comes to poverty, poverty carries the face of a woman more than the ordinary person. So how are you able, when you're supporting development, to identify those vulnerable uh, voices and faces and support them? It is when we deliver as one. It is when we are integrated that we make sense. And it is when we are integrated that we are, we, are, we are able to look at them as an integrated part of the system rather than coming in with one part of the reproductive system of a woman, another one the productive system of a woman, another one that, you know, and, and finally we lose that, that, that essence of it. I want to emphasize that we make relevance when we deliver as one. Secondly, we need to be relevant. And I think that was well elaborated today by the ED of UN Women in the morning when we looked at what we achieved in Beijing and the gaps that we had. We need to identify what the challenges of women are before we come out with a package in education to liberate them and support them. Even where we have laws and regulations that are supportive, below those laws, are they implementable? I'll just give one quick example. What we are observing in UN Habitat is that most of, for instance, the laws on property, especially land, the conventional system, it's benefiting less than 30% of the population. That is, on average, in Africa. And even within that 30%, only 3% of women have access to security of tenure of land. So you will have the laws, but when you get down to how those laws are empowering the people, then you find a, a problem. So we need to identify those gaps and give that support. And that's how we have come up with a system that is uh, supporting governments to get access to what I'm calling like the continuum of land rights. Assess the existing uh, ownership of land processes identify them and see how you can formalize them so that as development takes place, it does not trample over those who are not captured in the conventional official systems. So we need to go down to detail. And because of that, I want to come to the next point. We have a good program with Mashav, and I want to thank you so much for the wonderful work that we have done, Hava. And in that, we were, we were looking at uh, training um, gender in local government. Because we know that even while we have good national policies, the implementation responsibility is at city level. And the differences between the cities and the towns are so huge, and the capacity to deliver is very low. So you talked about, uh, Hava, how your family moved from one place to Casablanca. Now, the world is moving. More than half the world population is in, living in cities and towns. 
And the pace at which we are moving to towns and cities is so high that it had better be an opportunity for the woman and the girl child. What I like about urbanization, when I remember, because I come from a rural background and I'm a veterinarian by profession, somehow I managed to get attracted to the city because I realized that the life of the farming systems is dependent upon the market and the well-being of the city. So I went for the city. Now when I get there, then I realize the power that is in there and how we are missing on the table as women and how we need to take really charge of that. So what I'm trying to say is, what is urbanization bringing on board for women and girls? It's an opportunity for us to disentangle ourselves from the, from the, the cultural and traditional norms that often tie us within a, the hierarchy of the history of where we come from. And many people, when they go to towns and cities, it's then that the girl child can actually take a bicycle and ride. It's then that they can do different things. But are they safe? Oftentimes, they are not safe enough to take. It is in towns and cities that you can access education, that you can access the school nearer, that you can access. But is it accessible to the woman and the girl child? So we, as UN Habitat, are really advocating and we're working closely with the sister agencies to ensure that urbanization is well governed, is planned to enable the woman and the girl child and everybody else to have access to these opportunities. Because we are seeing that even though we have rules and regulations that say general education for all, the amount of work that the girl child has to do before they go to school is so much that without planning, it becomes practically impossible. And unfortunately, much as we have done so much, well, I'm sorry to say that we still have one billion people in the world living in slums and slum-like conditions. And for them, education is number two. First and foremost is, is, is surviving and, and safety and security. So we must work together to break all these barriers. I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to make it united with a commonness of voice. And that, I think, is the beauty of the UN as a system. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Aisa. Um, a holistic approach to education for the girl child and training of women leaders to, have, to make a real difference in their spheres of influence. Madam Jean, okay. over to you. Well, um, I'm here to speak about an invisible group, women with disabilities. There are 650 million women with disabilities worldwide. This is the largest minority amongst the female population. This huge minority is largely invisible on the public agenda, on the women's movement agenda, and until recently, even on the disability agenda. We cannot afford to be silent or ignore such a significant minority. I therefore thank Nelly and the Israeli mission for inviting us to bring this issue to the fore today. A friend of mine, Bella, who has polio, and uses a wheelchair says that having the double stigma of being a woman and having a disability is nothing short of a catastrophe. This double st stigma makes you doubly vulnerable. If women in general are discriminated against, women with disabilities are much more vulnerable. For example, women with disabilities are twice as likely to be physically and sexually abused than non-disabled people. Who speaks out for these women who have no voice? Who will speak out for a woman with a severe intellectual disability or autism who cannot communicate with a police officer or is too scared to complain when her abuser is her caregiver on whom she is dependent? This increased risk is seen in all fields, including less opportunity for education, employment, health services, family life, and of course, they, most of them live in dire poverty. So what action is called for changing this reality? The UN recently recognized the challenge, and in Section 6 of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, there is a call for special attention to ensure the rights and, and equal opportunities for this most marginalized group, girls and women with disabilities. Israel ratified this, and together with Beskut, um, and, and a rights organization in Israel. We are leading its implementation in Israel and work closely with parliamentarians in our country to change legislation 
and advocate for the implementation of the uh, Convention. However, we all know that laws and policies and conventions are only one piece of the puzzle. In our experience, the development and implementation of education and awareness programs are essential to change the double stigma faced by women with disabilities. <coughs> the need for self-advocacy groups is a must, and the training of disability leaders is a must, and Beit Izzy Shapira is doing both. In addition, we created a model that was replicated nationally on how to bring together mothers, religious, secular, Jewish, Arab, veteran and new immigrant mothers from the Soviet Union who formed a common task force to change the state of services in their region. These women have become serious change agents and it makes me optimistic to see the power of women who stand together. My standing before you today gives me an opportunity to call for the general gender goals and objectives to also be inclusive of women of dis with disabilities. Nothing about us without us. The slogan of the disability movement means nothing without people with disabilities. And I mean here today, nothing about women without women with disabilities. And nothing about disabilities without women. We have learned at Beit Izzy Shapiro that the greatest achievements in social change that we have managed to lead have only come through collaboration. Therefore, I call for a greater collaboration between the disability and women's movements. Imagine the inclusive society we can make if women with and without disabilities fight side by side for the rights of all women. Then we could celebrate differences and similarities while teaching the community to be truly inclusive for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. We really indeed need to live in an inclusive society and recognize that women living with disabilities have a double stigma, which makes them doubly vulnerable. And we need to really take action on that. Thank you so much. Now, we have time for just one or two questions. Uh, yes, could you please identify yourself? And, uh, and uh, please, it's not statements, but questions. Uh, if we can make them very brief, I uh, will start with you and then uh, Madame there in uh, orange and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Inas Midul, I'm from Libya, uh, who currently pursue my Master in Gender and Women's Studies. I just want, I have one question. What are the gender approaches that are uh, being taken by the Israeli government for uh, incorporating gender approaches in uh, early education and also high-level education in, into the curricula? The second question, I've, I've noticed that many of the examples that for childhood marriage, uh, either in Morocco or uh, uh, childhood marriage, either in Morocco or in other parts of the world, uh, organi transnational organizing, is that means that there's no such a problem in Israel? If there is such a problem in Israel, what are, how, what the Israeli government are taking action against that? And also, in, in the light of the intersectionalities, uh, intersectional communities there, uh, Jewish and Arab. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is uh, dependent on uh, what we all know about the world indicators, the World Bank, the UNESCO, the UNICEF, and the UN, where we are, that education for sustainable development is the way to go. Now, we have in this uh, hall uh, presented pockets of strategies that the Israeli government is doing. I would like to know, going forward, in this room, we are, uh, majority of us are women. The women from the less developed or the developing countries are here. They are here because they have made arrangements on managing their households. And they are actually managing these households from here. When they are faced out, when they are no longer there, who is going to take over? 
I am wondering whether there are strategies for empowering young minds around the world, knowing about nature, knowing about uh, uh, indigenous knowledge, knowing about everything as they grow up, as we prepare them. What are these strategies that we will move with forward to change the world? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I will uh, hand over the question to Ambassador. You didn't introduce <coughs> yourself. <laughs> My name is uh, Mary yes. from Kenya. I'm a university professor and I work with young children because I have been working with adolescent girls and boys and changing them is tough. Yeah. <laughs> so Must I have gone to young children to bring these minds, to sharpen them, and to empower each other, both boys and girls. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful to meet you, and thank you for your contribution. I will hand over to um, Ambassador Roth and uh, also uh, Ms. Yardena first to, to answer the, the first questions uh, on uh, gender approaches in early education and also in tertiary education um, in, in your country and uh, also whether there's child marriage um, in, in Israel, considering the cultural uh, differences. And then other colleagues will answer on the issue of the Education for Sustainable Development. But first, over to you. Uh, you asked about um, uh, children education. So uh, just um, recently, maybe uh, two years ago, um, a legislative um, uh, um, was uh, held in Israel that um, uh, children uh, from age um, three uh, will have uh, free education. And uh, in order to encourage um, mothers, um, young mothers, to um, uh, go to work and to be uh, economically um, uh, independent. Uh, we have um, a tax um, uh, uh, subsidized the crochets and uh, baby um, uh, mining services, and uh, it um, enabled them to work and uh, com with the com um, combined with the free education from age three. That's what the government uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just uh, want uh, to add regarding uh, different societies in Israel. Uh, first of all, regarding the situation in Israel, I think we have here uh, uh, some kind of detailed uh, uh, document which everybody can pick up, which uh, details uh, the situation of women in Israel, as I mentioned before. Uh, uh, much better than it was 20 years ago, uh, still far from being uh, uh, perfect now, but these are some of the programs that, that uh, uh, we're doing. One thing that I would like to add is, as a country which uh, some call uh, the startup nation, with a very, very uh, significant and important, uh, important development uh, uh, center for the world and uh, uh, high-tech industries, we must uh, and we're trying to put more emphasis on, on having women in, in the science and technology and, and, and educated and to be a part of this booming, uh, booming uh, industry. Uh, with, with regards to uh, the Arab population, I, I must say, I think uh, when we heard here about uh, the, you know, the Golda Meir in 1956, when it's, it started their understanding of uh, development, and being a part of the world had, uh, you know, was was uh, pre much of what we hear today about 1967, as well as the cooperation that, for instance, the Golda Meir Center does and Beth Easy Shapira with uh, uh, women, whomever they are, from wherever they are. And and uh, I must say, as a representative of Israel, uh, if we will not have uh, equality, not only between men and women, but between the uh, the different and very diverse uh, society that Israel has, our future is, is not uh, 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 as secure as we would want it to be. So it is a part of what we have to do to work, make things better, and to invest in societies that are weaker. And in every one of those societies, whether it's the ultra-Orthodox 
uh, society or, or, or the Arab society or, or what uh, those who are very familiar with Israel, uh, it's called Ashkenazic being European or, 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 or Jews who came from, from, from Arab, Arab states still are gap. If you don't in, invest in those areas, you cannot, uh, you'll never continue. So it's not only the moral and right thing to do, it's also uh, uh, economic uh, and, uh, and, and something that every country has to invest in. So we're halfway there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, we have run out of time. Uh, uh, I would like to really congratulate um, the uh, permanent mission of Israel for an excellent, um, you know, program. I think what what we have gathered. Let's finish first. Don't run away. Uh, what what we have gathered here is that. Education must be holistic. It must equip, it must provide the right services for the girl child, and it must protect the girl. And also, we've learned that we must train women leaders to make a real difference. Third, education must be multi-dimensional. We must use uh, different media. We have seen the story of Hannah and how it has impacted all of us here. Education should be inclusive, and uh, inclusive of the entire society, men and women, boys and girls, including people living with disabilities. And education must be relevant and lead to sustainable development. It must lead to prosperity for all. I thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a difficult time.